Opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go under the hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood Show. I'm Chris Carter, played by <laughs> no, you're not. Russ Evans. <laughs> and uh, that's Russ over there. Thanks Hi, for joining us under the hood. And Shannon Nordstrom. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. Doug Mashick, Prairie House Productions, sitting in the booth. How you doing there? Friendly wave from the guy you cannot see. You can't see him on the radio either. But you can hear him. Yeah, you can. They, they used to say, see you on the radio. and yeah, Whatever. You don't see anybody. You do see us on the radio, because if you're watching us on YouTube right now, at Under the Hood Show, where you'll find us on YouTube, you would see us as we're on the radio. And you could make an appointment. A radio appointment to listen, there you or go. a YouTube appointment, or a podcast appointment can be more flexible. YouTube appointment can be more flexible. Just turn on your radio and listen. That's yeah. What we, that's what we want you to do. So, Close to 250 radio stations across the country, you can do just that. And, we thank uh, each and every one. Thank you for the, the uh, stations that are out there that are part of the network. We really appreciate it. You know, I could go into all sorts of good stuff, but I think uh, the listeners want to hear us just jump right in and... Uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to go to the phone and we're going to talk to John with a 2002 Jeep and we're going to do that right away. Just get just get rolling on this thing. So, John, how you doing? Well, good. What is up with that 02 Jeep? Okay, uh it's it's got 251 rounds on it. Okay. And uh it it's been coming on kind of slow, but you know that like when you let up on it, it kind of wants to veer to the right. And if you accelerate, you know, not hard or nothing, and then it wants to veer to the left. And it'll do it now. Uh, like, I just went and got feed for my wife's chickens and that yesterday. And even on a gravel road, like at 20 miles an hour, if you decelerate, it'll do it. And if you accelerate, it'll do it, you know, even on a gravel road. And I've had it up on the hoist. We have a hoist in our shop. And I can't make nothing move. To, you know, the other than, I don't know, the, Pushings in the lower rear control arms, they look like they're, you know, well, they're cracked and weather checked, of course, you know, it's not a new vehicle. Could them lower control arms be doing that? Yeah, or the, the, um, what kind of Jeep is this? Grand Cherokee? And, uh, yeah, Grand Cherokee, four liter. I, okay. I thought at first, you know, I, I took the dry shaft off and stuff, you know, I thought, well, maybe there's a bang going on in the dry shaft. But that's not it. Well, to pull to one and, side, what you have to have going on is something that would either change the alignment or change the amount of drag you have on one wheel or the other. Typically on a vehicle like this, it's going to be something in the alignment. So if you step on the throttle, the axle moves to the left a little bit or the right. You're, if it's a solid axle, like a regular Jeep, but if you've got a, a right. uh, independent yeah. front suspension, you yeah. know, it would just be a control oh, arm. But, yeah, yeah, O2 Grand yeah, Cherokee solid. with that solid axle, you, you do see problems with... Track bar. Yeah, the track bars on the front end. Um, and, you know, they, they get loose, or sometimes you'll even see the rust that'll start happening mm -hmm. in the tops of the either the spring perches or where the control, you know, the lower control arms hook in, the ones that go back to the frame. And so, you yeah, know... You, it's, on, it's on the front axle. Yeah, that's right. what I mean, on the front axle. And that, yep. that could be shifting that front axle upon acceleration, deceleration, um, you know, making it go okay. that one pitch it that one direction just a little bit. I, I'd i be very suspect about the mounting of that front axle and, and how that all sits in there. When it's up on a hoist. So I'm looking at the wrong end of the Jeep you're telling me. Oh, look at the front. I think look yeah. at the front. Yeah. Look at the front. When it's up in the air and it's hanging and you've got all yep. that weight hanging yep. on that track bar, it's going to pull really hard to the side. So it's it's going to be very hard to, you'll shake everything, move everything. Everything may feel tight, but it's hanging down. If you were to, yeah. one thing you might do is sometimes if you, if you lower it, 
down to the ground where the tires touch and then the springs just start to collapse. You don't want all the way to the vehicle on it, but you don't want them hanging in the air, just somewhere in between and then rock the vehicle back and forth a little bit, left to right, and look at that track bar, and you might be able to see it then, because we've had quite a few where we put on the hoist just up enough to release some of the weight, you know, so we've got maybe 500 to 1,000 pounds on that suspension, and then rock it back and forth, and we'll see that track Be bar. side to side. Right, side to side. So you'll see it, that track bar okay. move in and out on the end. That's the most <laughs> common thing. No. That's a lot of okay. miles. Now, what if I take my safety stands and uh, one on each side and, and, and put some, you know, raised in front axle while it's still on the hoist, actually, but raised front axle so there's weight on the stands. You know, takes weight off, you know, would that, would that, then, then I'd be able to see it better or not? That could help a little bit too. Just watch it so when you're rocking it, it doesn't, I've had them get kind of squirrely on the, on the stands when they're like that. But sometimes you can find that play a lot easier. Also, if you set it on the stands on the ground or you get it down low enough where you can get under a tire with a pry bar, lift up on the bottom of the tire between the ground and the tire and look at your ball joints and see if they lift up and down a lot. No, that, that, that I have done. The okay. Hey, you're just trying to take pressure. You're, you want it to hang loose, but you want it to take the pressure off of it, so you got to keep that weight on there. I think that that's the safest way to do it because you, if you get the stands and then you then you miscalibrate your your weight, yep. you, all of a sudden you're taking weight off your hoist arms, and you know that could create a problem if you miscalibrate right. it. So we don't yeah. we, we don't want to see you no. do that. No, I, 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 thinking, we're thinking it's on the front end because the front end is going to steer you a lot more and dive you one way or the other. The back end would do a little bit of that, but it would it would you know a back end will typically trail and not give as as a definitive of a change as you're describing. How long has it been doing yeah, this? Yeah. Well, it's been coming on slow, but it's been gradually okay. getting worse. You know, it feels like it, like the back end is losing traction. It feels like the back end wants to get away from you. Well, then I would definitely look at the rear end as well, the same components, because it, it since we're not driving it, we can't feel what's going on. But if the no, back end no. goes off to one side, that could do it as well. If it's moving, typically, you know, when that track bar gets loose, it's going to move a lot because that thing, it, it's supposed to keep it straight as the vehicle goes up and down. That's why it's at that, set at a, a, a perfect angle the way they designed it at the factory. But if it's loose on one end, yeah, it'll push the vehicle off to one side as it moves, as it goes up and down. So if you hit a bump, it'll move off to the side as well as giving it gas. Because when you give it gas, it tries to twist that rear axle and it'll push it over to one side if the bushings aren't solid in it. Yeah, you know, see, like going down the road, guys. I mean, it. You can. I mean, you can let go of the steering wheel. You know, it, it'll it'll just drive down the road just as nice as can be, as long as you don't decelerate or accelerate. You know. That sounds like it's got to have a. It's almost got to have a loose bar in it. That's the first thing I'd be looking for if I had it in our shop and I was driving down the, driving down the road testing it. Well, thanks for calling us, and hope we can give you some right. different ideas right. to look at. We appreciate it very much. Appreciate it, John. Okay, thanks. thanks. All right, thanks, guys. Bye. So many cars come in that pull to one side, like if they get a little loose traction or something or, you know, rain, snow, and they're like, hey, this thing dives to one side in the rear. Uh, and a lot of it's alignment. We used to see the Grand Am seemed to be the worst. I mean, we had so many of those come in, and now we're seeing a bunch of Ford Fusions that do that as well. So we're going to take a quick break. And uh, when we're done with that, we're going to be right back with your calls. 866-594-4150. This is the Under the Hood Show, brought to you by Sturdivant's. Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. Welcome back to the Under the Hood Show. I'm Russ Evans, along with Shannon Nordstrom. Welcome, hoodies. There you go. Thanks for tuning in do so it. we can help you tune up. I usually don't do it right there, but we'll do it again. That's all right. 866-594-4150. And the reason we're here is all about you and your calls. So we're going to go right back to the phones. And we're going to talk to Ron in Oregon with a 2009 Pontiac Vibe. How are you, Ron? Doing pretty good. Uh, had a bit of a year. I've been missing you guys. I want to thank you for what you do for everybody. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, just come back after, well, I had some heart failure problems, but 
so well, I didn't get to see as much. Um, we're glad they went under the hood and got you figured out a little bit so you can get back to us. Yeah. Oh, I praise God. Uh, when I went in December 29th of last year, I had a 10 to 15% chance of coming out of open heart surgery. Oh, wow. So, we're glad I'm you're glad here. Yeah. Here. Let's yeah. celebrate and see if we can help you with yeah. your vibe. Get, get your vibe back. Yeah. I got to get my vibe back. Uh, and that's part of what my problem is. I decided to go to a uh, higher authority <laughs> because one of the drugs they have me on kind of messes with my memory and stuff. Oh, uh, so I bought this 2009 Vibe, and I'm going to give you as much information right up front. And it had a P0301 code, cylinder one misfire. Sure. And it would, and it scared me right away because I had a blinking uh, check engine light, and the VSC and the TSC lights are on. And so I found the code, and I thought, okay. So I switched the cylinder one fuel injector and uh, coil pack to cylinder two, expecting it to move. It didn't. I had also found that a previous owner had cut the wires to the cylinder one injector and had it twisted together and held with wire nuts, mm. which I immediately cleaned, fluxed the wires, soldered, and shrinked. Uh, tube them and so went that way well that didn't solve it then i thought oh, maybe intake vacuum leak so i changed intake manifold gasket didn't change it uh cleared the codes got a check engine light that was just solid for a while then in the past well like i said i just bought it saturday a few days i've discovered that if I keep the RPMs at 2,800 RPM or higher, I will never get a check engine light. The VSC goes off, the TSS goes off, and it will run fine. But as soon as I drop below 2,700 RPM, within a mile or two, I'll get a blinking check engine light. I'll throw the P0301 code. If I immediately pull over to the side of the road, shut the car off, start it again, sometimes the check engine light will completely go away. Sometimes I'll get a solid check engine light, but it'll run just fine. But prior to that, when the blinking check engine light comes on, I lose power much like uh, it's in limp mode. Sure. So before I start playing cart darts, I wanted to know if there was anything on these that you guys might know. I've got a cylinder leak down tester on order coming in, but it hasn't arrived yet. I, that for us would be one of the first place we start. Because, Make sure we got a healthy hole. Yeah. If we've got uh, a problem with the, uh, let's say timing on that, we're going to timing chains, which is, can be common on these as they get older. We'd have more than one cylinder that had this issue. But you've got a misfire just on 301 is cylinder one. So that's just one cylinder. The 301, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, that's your yeah, cylinder yeah. number. So an appeal 300 were to be random. But if you've got just one, I would guess you probably have, you've already checked that injector. Unless the computer has an issue, which it could with the, like the driver to that injector. Maybe it was shorted because they had the wires cut, and they could have been cut for a remote start to be interfaced into that. That's why they were originally cut. It's hard to say. Um, I would really look at that cylinder to make sure that it, it sounds more like a valve and not in the uh, the bottom end and the pistons, but it could be like a broken valve spring, which can be repairable in the car by pulling the valve cover off and applying air pressure to that cylinder then you can use a spring compressor and pop the broken springs off and replace them. I'd really lean towards that. It just, with what we know about these cars, as many as that we've seen, there could be a dozen other things too, but with what we see, it's leans us a little towards the direction of, of a broken, yeah, broken I'm, valve spring I'm or something. I'm afraid of that. But the other thing is, is when I turn the key, I don't get um, an uneven cranking. It, you might you know, not because like if you had low yeah if and, you've got uh, low on one thing is, it could do it 
Yeah, and the second thing is I have a light spark knock at partial throttle. Okay. And those are all the, that's everything. If you had a light spark knock, that could also come from a, a problem where you've got a valve hanging open a little bit. You know, you've got a lean condition going on there or something where you're not, you're not running the combustion like you should. Um, if you're dumping fuel into the cylinder and it's not firing at the low RPM, but then you rev it up just a little bit and it starts to fire, you've got, you've got fuel in there that was unburned and it's probably pre igniting in there and causing that, that detonation, the spark knock you have. So that, that is a possibility. I would, you know, before you go any further, I would just go straight to the, to the leak down tester and see what the leak down is on all four cylinders. And if a cylinder one is excessive, I'd pop that valve cover off and, Take a real good look at those springs and see what they look like. Make sure the valves are completely closing. Does that help you out a little bit? Well, it's kind of where I was thinking I might have to go. I was hoping there might be another sensor or something, but nope, that's, thank you very much. That's I'm it. Oh, at yeah. the edge of my knowledge. <laughs> well, you've you've done a lot already, it sounds like. And you know, that first move you made of moving the injector and the coil, that was what we tell people a lot of times do to see if the problem travels with the component. And it didn't, and so that was good thinking. And uh, we'll be saying prayers for your recovery. You you get yourself feeling uh, oh, a lot better. That, that I'm glad to hear you. Hang yeah. in there. Well, I I'm, I'm just kind of new to this digital stuff. I I was ten years in auto salvage and work. My family was mechanics, so I have a clue. But these newer ones throw me. <laughs> well, and you got an '09 vibe there, which Chris would make a vibe joke about now if he was here with us today. But uh, that that is a, oh. a it's a Toyota in disguise. I mean, it. There's a recall on yeah, that right now. I just saw the other day a big one, like for an 09 Vibe. Like all of them, yeah. Something crazy. It was something to do with Toyota and Vibe. I gotta. I'm gonna have to look that up on the break here and see what it was. But I mean, what my point is though is those engines were, you know, the Corollas and different things. They were good, solid engines as a rule, and so they'll. We've seen those cars come in with three, four hundred thousand miles on mm-hmm. them. And, and they're just hanging in there and just doing their thing. And so, you know, I would have some optimism that this is not a big problem. And let's get the the base baseline checked first, and then we can look a little deeper. All right. Take care, Ron. Thank you very much, gentlemen. You have a good day. You too. All right. We're going to jump right back in, and we're going to get with Bill, who has a 2008 Avalanche. Hi, Bill. Hi. How are you doing? We're doing excellent. But how is your avalanche doing? Well, you know, when, it's, when I go to start it in the morning, if the outside temperature is around 30 degrees, I turn the ignition on, all the bells and whistles and lights come on, but I've got nothing at all there. I mean, no, you know, like if, if it was a starter, it'd go, uh, well, this, there's nothing. And if I wait about, you know, a couple of two, three hours and it's outside temperature warms up, it'll start right up and it runs like a charm. It's been doing this for about, I don't know, three weeks. I put a new battery in it, took it into a shop, and they put a new starter in it. They said that was the problem. The next morning, bang, same deal. You know, the starter didn't solve it. Yeah, it's... Right off, it sounds like a starter is the most common thing, but the other things that can do that on an 08 would be the either the neutral safety switch in the transmission, which is going to give a reading to it to tell it, hey, we're in park or neutral and it's allowed to start, or the starter relay under the hood in the relay center, the fuse relay center under the hood. Those would be the most common things, and then down the line from that would be the ignition switch itself it sounds like it's just temperature related, maybe some moisture, humidity, fog, things like that. And the air can do that. We would plug a scanner into it, read the scanner and see if when we turn the key to the crank position and it's not starting, if it's not turning over, if the scanner says that the key is in the crank position, if it does not, then we've got a problem with the ignition switch circuit and that power that we would need to test. If it does say it's in the crank position, but we look at the transmission and see it's not in a park neutral position. We know we've got something going on in that circuit wiring or the switch itself. So it's, it's fairly reasonably easy to diagnose, but it will take a scanner and a little bit of time and possibly a little volt handheld voltmeter too. Right. And, uh, another thing is, you know, after they put the starter in, when I got 
ride home the next day, and it didn't do it. I took the, you know, the battery ground off of the motor, yep. cleaned the terminals of it, put it back on, and then the next morning, I wasn't home. My wife went out to start it. It started, but it ran for about two seconds and quit. If it just started and started ran for... Again, you know, that short start and shut off, it sounds like possibly like something that an ignition switch because that's where your security is. And if that's not reading correctly, when you start it, it'll die right away. It can start and die, start and die, but then it did. And if it didn't start when it's cold and it also started and died there, I would really look at that switch. And you could see that on the scanner as well. It'll tell you if the security's active. So that help you out a little bit? All right. Hopefully. All right. Well. Good luck with her. Take care. All right. You, you bet. Too. Have a good day. Bye. Welcome back to the Under the Hood Show, 866-594-4150. I am Russ Evans along with Shannon Nordstrom. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. We've got a hoodie to give away, courtesy of our friends over at Universal Technical Institute. UTI.edu is where you'll find them. If you're learning to be a mechanic, you, you want to learn more about that, visit uti.edu today and find out. And our winner this hour is Dan Silverton. Congratulations for everybody under the hood here and our friends over at uti.edu, Universal Technical Institute. And we are going to jump right back into the phones. And we're going to talk to Ethan, who has a 2005 Silverado. How you doing, Ethan? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? Well, not too bad. Let us know about that Silverado. How's its health doing? Um, other than a rather rusty bed, it's doing pretty good. Uh, my issue is my brake light on the dash flickers on and off, and I'm trying to figure out how to trace down what is causing that, and it's got me running in circles at the moment. Well, there's two main inputs to that that, that are super common. One is the brake fluid level switch in the master cylinder. And if it gets just a tiny bit low, I mean a tiny bit on fluid, it can have that light blink on and off as you're moving around or even the engine just sitting there vibrating at idle if it's if it's just in that range. So or, or a little contamination on that sensor. Mm-hmm. Sometimes if it you know, if that fluid at as an O five, not that we ever say you should overchange your fluid, but there is a point where it can get a a little contamination in it with age, and that can do that sensor no good. Like 19 years later. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I did change all that out because uh, I bought it from a, one of my foremen, and uh, vehicle maintenance was against his religion. So <laughs> I've been fixing a lot of things. Chris and him would have got along good. Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> so just double-check that fluid level first, and then the second thing we do is pull up on that parking brake pedal and make sure that it is completely closing the switch. There's a switch on that pedal, of course, that when you step on the brake, it turns the light on. And sometimes the pedal will be up, but the brake cables will be frozen in the rear of this vehicle. So it won't put any tension on the little winder inside that, that shuts off the, the brake switch. So if you pull up on it, it doesn't do any good. You might just get under the dash and find the little switch that's on the pedal mechanism and see how it pushes down when the pedal comes up. And then just push it and hold in that position and look at the dash and see if the light went off. If it does and your parking brakes don't work anyways in the rear, figure out a way to get around that switch. You know, there's ways to do it. Um, Not too hard. But those are the most common things. Now, after that, usually the only thing we see is a problem in the anti-lock brake control module where it's trying to turn on that light. And it, if that's what's going on, it's usually a steady blink, like a turn signal light, on, off, on, off, that type of thing. If it's just kind of a vibrating random on, on, off, on, off, on, you know, like as you go, that's usually more likely in that fluid level switch or in the pedal switch. What kind of flash does it have? A steady, exactly it, the it, same? The light stays on about 70% of the time super dim and just kind of flickers as you drive along. Um, I topped off the fluid and didn't know if maybe it was a loose wire in the sensor and was wondering if the switch under the pedal might be an issue, but uh, all the brakes in the rear are 
just redone. I did all that cables, cables? everything. Right. I got to get this. I got to get it ready for a safety inspection. So oh, I rebuilt yeah. the front end. Th- this is my last thing that's driving me up a wall. Check that. They that, won't pass it if no, that brake light's on. No, in a lot of states, you know, that have that safety inspection, they require those parking brakes to work. So uh, some states don't. Some states do, but uh, I would like because of the way you're describing that the module is what takes uh, the the dim light that shouldn't happen with the fluid level switch because that's either on 100 percent or off 100 percent because it is running through a module that that hydraulic control unit to turn that on but if it's lit dim that's actually a physical connection between your switch and that light on the dash so i yeah i'd go for that switch i'd look look for it down there and see what's going on i bet it's not it's just not pulling up all the way. And it may be that your parking brakes are working correctly back there, but when it comes up, it just doesn't have enough tension on the switch and you might have to bend the tab just an eighth inch or so, maybe a little more to get it to when it's up to be off. All right. Thank you very much for your advice, gentlemen. You're all right. Useful and helpful every time. Thank you. We appreciate it. Take hope, care. Hope Ethan. your inspection goes well. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Uh, thanks guys have a good one you too see ya all right we're gonna jump right back in again 866-594-4150 and you can get on we got a couple spots open there we're gonna jump in and talk to keith in wisconsin with a 2010 ford escape hi keith well hello i'm I'm floored to be on the radio (laughs) so are we we're blessed to do it and we're we're glad we've got people like you that make it possible yeah so anyway, I never, never had a vehicle that didn't have a, a, a poor steering reservoir on it. This is all electronic and stuff. And, uh, uh, I ran errands with it one day and then, uh, the next morning I went out and it, it ran fine the day before. And then I was backing out of my garage and, and my power steering is, is, you know, gone, but it was, it, uh, I looked in the book and it says that, you know, it's okay to operate it like that. Uh, I, I talked to a couple of mechanics that were at our Ford dealership here in Green Bay and uh, they uh, find out, you know, what is this a, you know, a regular problem with this, this year of uh, escapes. And apparently, yeah, they said that there's a sensor in the, in the steering column that, uh, that, Sometimes happens. Uh, I talked to other people that had port escapes and stuff. They never had any problems like this. So, uh, and that's the case. I mean, there's going to be people that are going to own them their whole lives and never have a problem. And so they'll they'll tell you that Ford Escape's the best thing they've ever owned in that department. And then you'll get somebody yeah. that had the 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 steering column uh, assist. <laughs> there's an assist motor. How do you say it, Russ? There's right. a, yeah, it's electric assist. Electric assist that's on the bottom of the steering column. And right. Sometimes those fail, and because I know from our standpoint at the auto recycling side of things, we sell those. People people buy them, and they there's a pretty good demand. They bring three hundred to seven hundred bucks for a used one, and seven hundred bucks for a used one. Yeah, I'm just telling you. Now, don't get too freaked out because maybe that's not your problem, but be that's the only reason that they would have that kind of market demand is because there is failing, and the new ones are quite a bit more expensive or sometimes not available and almost yeah, like every hundred bucks yeah and like every vehicle made now is all electric there's i, I can't think the of steering. a single one that is not right the steering i can't think of a single one that is not electric and the reason they're doing that is to allow for things like the smart backup where you can just put it in reverse and it'll parallel park for you when you back up and people thought that was crazy i remember when it first came out but now that they can basically drive themselves down the road with super crews and all these different things. They need to have control of that steering and they do that by the electric motor. So, and they also, they started off doing it with that in mind, but they also wanted to take some of the horsepower robbing stress away from the drive accessories. And by making it yep. an electric motor, they could, they could take away quite a bit of load off the engine and get better fuel economy to try to match the cafe standards. But back to your escape, it, I know a lot of folks that have had this problem happen. If if this is the problem, I'm assuming it might be. And they were able to go to a local self-service facility because they're starting to see these escapes move into the self-service facilities and, and get one for 
less than a hundred bucks, maybe 30 bucks or something like mm-hmm. that. But the people that were able to do that got really fortunate that they were the first one there when the vehicle got set into the, into a self-service yard. Cause if it ends up in a, in a full service facility, like we have, um, we just, we know where the market's at and, and those items are going to get inspected and priced for a, a, a pretty fair price. You got to pull it, got to guarantee yeah, it yeah, and all yeah. that. But uh, th- now we're, we're going down that road pretty deep. Russ, is there any, from what you're experiencing, I know we just worked on one of these recently for an employee. Uh, is there any other sensors or anything that can get involved that would be not this uh, um, problem? Other than an alternator that is not putting out enough voltage. So it's trying to keep it's the engine. That. Yeah. It's other than that. that, we have never had anything else other than that steering electric steering gear fail. That's the only failure we've ever had in, in, in an escape. Um, in an F-150, there's actually a wire that comes loose by the fuse box. And it's a simple matter of turning the nut a eighth inch to the right. And well, it's fixed. I had a Ford Ranger for a lot of years too. And it was one of my best vehicles I ever had. They're a really good vehicle. So Ru- Russ, when this would come in to you, what's, uh, based on what we've learned over the years and based on what we know, what would the diagnostic steps be before you'd say, Hey, you need a. A scanner to communicate with it and see if there's any codes in it. And if there are codes inside of it, none of them are repairable other than not enough voltage. So it could be we've got a, a wiring issue, corrosion on power or ground. Other than that. Well, this this, this uh, special escape that I have, I bought, it's got a total, I don't know if it's a new, it, it's labeled as a rebuild. Sure. The engine is, is like brand new. Uh. The, ori- the original engine had like 194,000 miles on it. They replaced the engine. Uh, I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Can uh, I can I back up and ask you, ask a little deeper into your question? What is labeled as a rebuild? Uh, Title I, or the engine? The engine. Okay. I mean, you, you open up the hood and the engine looks like it's brand new. If it's right? a rebuilt so engine, you dropped a new. The thing is spotless. It's totally clean. I'll bet you know it's that's a that's a possibility. If they put a rebuilt engine in this, when they took it out, there's a major ground back there on the back uh, from that steering rack, grounded. Right. And if you pull the engine out, you you can disturb that. So it may not be tight or clean. So the first thing we would look at would be the power and ground, and they're huge. They're like battery cables. There's a starter. lot of amperage in the, you know pulling in mm-hmm. that system. Same like a starter on a car. Well, so. I disconnected the bat- the cables to the battery to see if it would reset itself. Sure. And uh, it didn't. This I is mean, down it, low. Yeah. Go go right to that. Go to the rack. Get a flashlight and shine down on the rack and pinion. You'll see the big electric part of it there. And follow those wires as they come in through the in the firewall area there and ground and okay. look where they ground and just see if the big heavy wires are. Are clean and tight, and and maybe they well, maybe they left one loose. You might even loosen, yeah. You might loosen them up if they're not, and just kind of reseat that that connection. It seems to be loosening up. It says in the book that it's okay to drive it like that. This is like driving a vehicle because I I learned how to drive a vehicle at oh yeah four power steering. Okay, so uh, before all this happened, I had like you got sensors in the tires, and and it. And it came on the dash that, that uh, there's there's Low a tire. bolt with with the sensors. Yep. And so I, for driving conditions, they they suggest that you you uh, have the pressure in the tire at 32 psi. Sure. So I I let the air out of the tire to 32, and it nothing happened. Uh, and then I, I went to that was in between summer driving, which is 34, winter drive. So I got out at Tire pressure right now is at 33, and uh, it's still on. So nothing, it didn't do anything. Pretty common for the sensors oh, to go bad. Yeah, that's yeah, just age. Sensors go bad, yes. Batteries, but yeah, I think on this, I I would look real, just just look real close at those those cables where the ground especially comes out for that steering rack and see if that's clean and tight because that that could cause all those problems. And if everything's tight. And there's no codes in it, and it's still dead. Then it sounds like it's going to need a. You got a if you box. got a local friend that's a good old boy that's got a hoist in their shop or a small oh, yeah, gas station. Funny. I'm a mechanic myself. Yeah, oh, let's right. get that baby. 
get it up on the air and inspect those those wires off that rack and pinion. Just give them a good old physical inspection. Make sure they're seated good and start with that. And then uh, then you're gonna have to get a hold of somebody with a scanner. But our most likely culprit is that is that uh, power steering mm-hmm. assist on the steering column. So. Am right. I going to eventually have to take this into a dealership and, and have them, uh, you know, go into the computer system on this thing? Uh, you should be able to replace that yourself. I don't believe there's any programming on that portion of it on a 10. As you get into the older ones, you didn't have to. The newer ones, you do. But I believe that thing you could do yourself if you had to swap it out. So. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for uh, thanks uh, for listening to the show and being a hoodie. We appreciate it out there in Green Bay. Well. You helped me out immensely, so. All right. Take care, Keith. <laughs> okay, you guys. Yeah. Boy. Oh, man, steering. Yeah, everything's gone electric now, so we're just kind of at the mercy of, of uh, electronics with, with everything. We just, it's just the way it's going to be, so. But we can get around it. We can, we can figure it out. We can do it. We're going to take a quick break. 866 866- Five nine four four one five zero. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show. Get your planner out right now and schedule your next radio appointment with the Motor Medics. Eight six six five nine four four one five zero. That's Under the Hood with Russ Evans, Shannon Nordstrom, and Chris Carter, who's not here today. So. We, we got his back. Yeah, we got his back because that's why he's not here. His back's out, and we we as people age, I have learned to not make jokes, and maybe that's a good personal thing to not laugh at somebody who's down, literally. But you know, we got a guy who had a heart condition there, Doug, and uh, praise God he got through the surgery. Okay, that's been a couple years now, but when he got back. I was I I said something just normal and he's a happy guy he loves to laugh and really friendly guy and he was laughing he's like oh <laughs> you know, oh I better watch I can't say anything funny I don't want to get him going and this morning Chris said <laughs> I don't know if he can hear us or not but uh, uh, he, maybe he was laying down and he says I couldn't reach the medication in the cabinet to feel better and I'm thinking could you ever reach the medication <laughs> see and he'd laugh at that if he was here and if he's listening now we're in trouble because he's probably oh, but yeah, it's unfortunately he's down and out and hopefully he'll, uh, find hopefully the remedy. He'll, yeah. He'll recover. That's, that's always a painful thing when that happens. So oh, we're going to jump into the phones and talk to Jim in North Dakota. How are you doing, Jim? Hi, good. Tell us about that. Oh, one Ram. Okay. So yeah, I got a Oh, one Ram with the diesel uh, motor in it. And I changed the fuel filter on it, and I noticed there was a little leakage coming from the valve on the side of the fuel filter. Oh, I sure. Think the, the greater valve. Yeah. And it, so I filled it up, primed the filter, everything was good, drove it around, and then uh, uh, my wife started it, and I happened to be standing at the right angle, and I seen some fuel leaking out underneath. And we drove it around for a little while, turned it off, and now it won't start. So I'm thinking it airlocked. I haven't even pulled the top off the fuel filter to see if it's emptied out or not, but I'm thinking it's airlocked. So do I crack the injector lines on that and and turn the key and to get the air out of them lines or, or what do you do for that? Well, the first thing we need to do is find out if the if we have a fuel filter full of fuel or if Correct. something is still leaking there. But if if you've got, if you've changed the fuel filter and you've got all the air out of it, you've bled it out using that valve and you've primed it and everything's working there, you should be able to crank it and fire it up. Um, it's pretty rare that we have to go any further with that and, and bleed them out on the, especially, you know, on an older one like that, it's, it typically will run. It could take longer to crank, but as soon as it cranks, it's going to go. But the problem is when you have air in a diesel fuel line between the high pressure pump and the injector, air is spongy. Just like when you bleed your brakes, you have a pedal that is spongy because you can compress the air, but you can't compress the diesel fuel as easily as you can that air. So it won't have enough pressure in there 
to open the pintle in the end of the diesel injector and allow the air to bleed out. It has to get more fluid in the line. If it can't get enough fluid in the line, it's never going to open that. It's going to be spongy for a long time. So there's been an occasion where we've had to bleed them out, but typically in our shop when, we, when we're when we replacing injectors and lines and things like that, we get that fuel filter blood out really well so we can get fuel to the pump, uh, make sure that there's no air between the pump and the fuel filter. Sometimes we've had to crack it open there and just make sure that's that's open. But once you get pressure to the fuel uh, injection pump, then it should have enough to, to kick the engine over. So you're saying it started and ran and then it just died, right? How long did it take? Um, We ran it around for a few days and oh. then just parked the house here. And when I went to start it, it just wouldn't turn over. Okay. And so I attributed that to, you know, my fuel filter kind of drained down from that leaky valve on the side, which I do have that part. I just haven't put it on yet. It's Yeah, it's got to be that because if, if it was something that happened when you first had it off of there, it would have happened immediately, like within a, a minute or less, probably 10, 15 seconds at the most. So if it drove for a few days, I'll, I'll bet it's bleeding down. You probably have an issue with that valve. So I'd, I'd replace that valve. I'd bleed it all out so it's good and primed and fired up it should start and then uh see what it see what it does and and go from there and hopefully that'll take care of those diesels don't like any air at all not even a speck they just they despise it so that help you out awesome i'll I'll yeah i'll definitely try that out all right take care jim yeah thank you these diesels boy they can get all they can be finicky but they're also uh, pretty reliable in a lot of cases. So most definitely this super cold we had, unfortunately we had a few people that had some diesels that had been, they had died last year. And when you own a diesel, you're going to be got to get prepared for a big repair bill if it ever happens and then save that money and use it on the replacement truck you get someday. Just kind of have an account to the side and whether that's just like I'm saving some money just in case, but you know, if an engine goes out or something major, you, you could be in trouble. So we had a couple of them that ran but the transmission's out and they were like last july so shannon these guys come in and what do you think happened because they brought the truck in that hasn't run since july and it's been <laughs> running up till then every day and it sat outside in 10 to 20 below weather for a week they had still their summer fuel in there yeah and they and, were and so they brought you in a big blob of jello solider than that more solid than that they were they were waxed up so hard that that it after the one now after a two week period of fairly decent temperatures like in the in 20s at night but 30s and 40s and 50s during the day one of them still gelled up really yeah so it, it takes longer for them to thaw than they do to uh, freeze hey russ what'd you find on that google look up on oh, that, that vibe recall. just real quick 0304 vibe they're saying stop driving your vehicle now because the takata airbags they replaced back in 2021 whatever or it was like that, yeah they're they could be dangerous and exploding shrapnel could uh could and they show harm about harm you they show about eleven thousand registered yet of in that era so yeah and we were thinking shannon's sure. like there's probably a thousand on the road i'm like oh they're showing like eleven thousand. i actually said 10 was it 10 cars <laughs> on the road <laughs> chris would shame him chris but yeah that's that's just the way it it goes but make sure you get them in because if one of those goes off it could be dangerous take care everybody under the hood is brought to you by sturdivants Welcome to the Under the Hood Show. I am Russ Evans along with Shannon Nordstrom. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. You can call us and get on the air with us and get under the hood. 866-594-4150. Well, Chris is out today, but he'll be coming back. Yeah, he'll he'll be coming back, back with a good back, <laughs> we hope. Get him back, back. That's get him and his back, back. But, uh, hey, Russ, before we go to the phones here, I've, I've had this note sitting here in front of me for... Like a while, a little bit. Well, and then I, you I'm, better read it. I'm going to use it, and then we're gonna we're gonna just say thank you for sending it. But uh, we got a note here from Joseph, and he said he goes, you know what? I listened to y'all when I was locked up in the Texas Department of Corrections on podcast pretty much all day long, cool. and now watching y'all's YouTube fee all right. live. I'm so grateful to be out of prison. Y'all really helped keep me going. Between reading the Bible and listening to you guys, I made it through. 
I've always wondered what the PTLA means, and it's praise the Lord anyway. I started from podcast from 2015 all the way to 21 to 23, and I just signed up for the Hoodie Fan Club. And um, there was another person that sent in a note that they had started watching while incarcerated in Florida, and uh, they really liked the show. And we get a, a note occasionally from folks that are incarcerated, and you know, there's some folks that have probably made some mistakes in society that are are uh, something that's going to keep them there for a while, and doesn't mean they can't get redeemed and they can't be better people. And so we're always about redemption, and uh, we want to give those people encouragement. And hopefully we can entertain you while you're working through a process in life that hopefully uh, you can get yourself in a in a better position. And we appreciate uh, all the people that listen, and uh, thank you. That was a really neat note to get, that to know that we could be doing what we do here in South Dakota and be encouraging somebody that's uh, a long ways from us uh, in, a, in a different position in life. And so thanks for the note. That, that was something I've been holding on to and I wanted to, I wanted to put on the air. Yeah, and we also wanted to thank uh, Thomas in yeah, Mississippi. Yeah, that's right. That was cool uh, too. Yeah, we really appreciate your generous donation to the Children's Miracle Network. You can find those links on our uh, for both Universal Technical Institute and Children's Miracle. Yeah, Network Thomas on, had sent a note into our producer Doug during the show and said, "You know, I really appreciate these guys. I'd, I'd like to um, send them something as a gift, as a thank you for helping." And we uh, said that gift, the best served would be Children's yeah, Miracle. Yeah, Russ, Russ chirped up and said, "Hey, let's get him to go that direction." And and so I handed him the note that Doug had given me, and and uh, that was pretty cool. He gave a nice donation, and so you can go to our website and do the same thing and support some of those causes, just like we do here at the End of the Hood Show. So thank you. Yeah, we appreciate it. We're going to jump into the phones and uh, go back to callers again and talk to Don in Minnesota with an 06 Jeep. How are you doing, Don? I'm doing just fine. Well, thanks for listening uh, to the show. What do you got going on with Jeep? Yeah. Well, I've got a vibration in it when I get up around uh, 60, 65, up to 70 mile an hour. It seems to be uh, uh Toward the back end, I kind of feel it in the seat of the car. It's not in the steering wheel. Uh, I've had tires balanced. I've actually replaced both the front and the rear drive shafts. And I did have it into a service place the other day, and they said they're thinking it's maybe the transfer case. But when I had the transfer case or the drive shafts out, uh, there was no play or anything in the transfer case uh, shafts or an opinion jack of the rear differential. So I'm kind of puzzled. Uh, it's, it's got 150,000 miles on it, so it's just my second vehicle. And what uh, kind of Jeep is it, have. Don? What kind of Jeep it's did you have? It's Grand Cherokee, Grand, uh, Grand, Grand Cherokee Laredo. And 06 it's would a, be that style with the independent front mm-hmm. suspension mm-hmm. and solid rear axle? Yep, yep. I was thinking my first thought was, like Jeep Liberty, of course, and the and the CV. Yeah, style. I know they would go bad so often that was real common. But you 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 it. said you put both brand new shafts in it already on the drive shafts. Yep, yep. And uh, you know, at first the the U drive they're they're not replaceable. You know, they're uh, mm-hmm. not rebuildable. So and the old ones did have a little bit of roughness to it. You know, a little stiff, but uh, it didn't make any difference on it at all. So. I'm kind of, kind of puzzled, and I, you know, I, I feel it when I'm under power. Like if you go up an incline, if you're just coasting along or let up on it, you don't feel it. As soon as you go up, say a hill, uh, incline, running about, you know, roughly 60, 65, that's when you really start feeling it. Well, you know, it could be a a, a number of things causing that from ignition miss to vibration, the drive on all the sorts of different things. Sometimes when they get so serious, we have to get really crazy and pull out things like a frequency meter and find out what order of vibration do we have and how that works is, you know, first order, second order, third order. Do we have a, and we can find out by the frequency, is it a tire vibration? Cause that's turning at one RPM or is it a drive shaft or vibration, which would turn it, you know, somewhere between three and four times the speed for frequency as a tire, because you've got, let's say, a, a, if it's a 410, it's turning around a little more than four times of the drive shaft to one rotation of the tire. So then we can check that vibration. And then we know 
but the RPM of the motor, we know what that RPM is, so we can look at that frequency, and we can break all that down and figure out which spot we have. But don't discount the tire problem, you know, a tire as a possible problem too quickly, even if they look good and they've been balanced, because if it's up on a hoist and you spin the tires and you look at the tread surface, if they hop up and down too much or too much side to side, they can vibrate at certain RPMs, but balance out perfectly because you could, you could put a, you know, a, a yardstick, tape it to the side of your tire and put a brick on the end of it and spin the tire and balance it. But you can imagine what that would do for your ride. And you know, that that's a little far exaggerated out there, but that's, that's how Uh much weight you can add to it and still balance it out on the other side, but you won't get a smooth ride because the tread is not contacting the road surface smoothly and properly. So have them, if you got a shop that's balancing those tires, have them look at it. Cause I, I know when I first learned about balancing tires and as I've taught people over my years of doing tires, um, a lot, none of us ever knew that even though it was perfectly balanced, it could still shake because of belts out of a line. So I take a peek at those things. Yeah. And yeah, then otherwise you do start, if you don't, if you start, you know, you could try moving the two front tires to the back and vice versa and see if that changes anything, just move them around, you know, by position. But then you do start getting into things like maybe there's something going on in the overdrive unit and the transmission that's making it shudder just a little bit. Uh, Do you ever see any movement in the tack would be things to look for Um, that, you know, they're, they're looking at that transfer case, but you don't want to just start swapping those things out. You're talking about a lot of money and you've already spent a lot of money. That's for sure. Right. right. Does that help you out, Don? Um, Well, yeah, I, I did have the tires balanced. Uh, I'm just wondering, can they, can a tire be, uh, like, on a balancer run at a higher speed to see if there's any kind of a wobble in it or, you know, yes. picking maybe a possible bad belt in it or they have something of that order. They have a machine called a road force balancer, which puts a load on the side of the tire to check that very thing. So you'd have to check with a bigger tire shop or one that has more equipment to do that, but ask them if they have a road force balancer and that could, that can okay. be very helpful in finding those kind of vibrations to eliminate the tires. I I did change out my two back tires. I took my spare tire and right. put one on at a time, and that did not change it. It did both the right and the rear, or right and the left. But you no, I have. haven't done the front tires. Try that next. I wouldn't next. think the front, I don't know if the front tires would do that. Well, I, not I not what you're feeling. feeling. It doesn't seem like it, but you want to rule that out. And that's sometimes just moving the two fronts to the back and the back to the front. Sometimes you can change something yeah. just if you do that. Could be more than one, too. So. But, but we're sure leaning towards that. But yeah. there are other things in that chassis. There are some alignment shops, too, that have the, the balancers in the, or the, you know, they can rotate on the floor, kind of like a dyno, uh, like a truck shop. A right. lot of times they have some of that stuff. You might have to get to somebody like that to, to get to the bottom of this. we got to take mm-hmm. a break. We're glad you called in. Okay. Yep, I appreciate it. Thanks, Don. Enjoy your show. Oh, I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Yep. 866-594-4150. That's our number. Give us a call and we'll get you on the air. The Under the Hood Show is brought to you by Sturdivant's. Prepare to learn something. You're going Under the Hood. Welcome back to the Under the Hood Show. 866-594-4150. Give us a call. Producer Doug will get you uh, lined up, and then he'll send them over to me, and buttons this, buttons that. And before you know it, it's like presto, and we're talking to uh, Steve with a 2002 Sedona. Good morning. How are you doing, Steve? Doing good. What's up with that Sedona? Wondering about, well, once in a while... You're cruising along, and it can be at slow speed, you know, in town, 30 miles an hour, or it could be on the interstate. You're doing 65, and all of a sudden, it, it's like it decides it needs to shift up or down or up or down again. What kind of things am I could cause that to happen? Well, typically, that's because it, it, it's shifting up and down when it sees a load change. That's the way it's supposed to do it. And that comes from the computer and its interpretation through things like mass airflow sensors, manifold air pressure sensors, road speed, throttle position. So the things, as long as the transmission is not on its way out, and we don't replace many of those transmissions, um, the engine and transmission both in that model vehicle are still 
pretty solid going back that far. It's some of the newer ones where we had some issues, but, um, you know, a, a mass airflow sensor that's dirty can cause that. It doesn't see the proper airflow and it can hunt for a gear is what they call it. Um, throttle position sensor that's not reading correctly can cause that. If I've got a scanner plugged into it, I can look at the, the patterns and or I could read the, the data and then I can plug an oscilloscope in there and look at the pattern and see what things look like. But at home, what you can do is just look at the mass airflow sensor and see if it's appears to be dirty. You know, you can pull it out and look at it. And, and even if it doesn't look real dirty, you can use like a can of Berryman B12 chem tool and clean that sensor off and then just let it air dry or blow on it, no compressed air and put it back together and see if that um, changes anything. Of course, check your fluid level to make sure it's full. Check the air cleaner to make sure you don't have a big restriction in there. All of a sudden, something you, you one of those that you pull out, like, oh, I haven't done that for a while. That's amazed me how many of those we've seen over the years where we've got a an air cleaner that's stuffed up and just won't breathe. We had one the other day that wouldn't accelerate very well. I pulled the air cleaner out; it was plugged. It it wasn't full over the top, but it was you couldn't see through it at all. It was just completely impacted. So the engine inside. was just starving for air. It couldn't breathe. It was like a plugged catalytic converter type thing. Oh, that's another thing, too, is if a catalytic converter, if this thing was an oil burner, use some oil and that converter started plugging up and it was restricted back back pressure so it wasn't getting the airflow, it could also cause some weird things like that, too. Sometimes more when it's hot than cold as they start to plug when they first start happening. So we've given you a laundry list of things to think about, yeah. and some are scary and some are not. So the least scary one on there is to um, find out where your mass airflow sensor is in that air tube sure and, clean. and clean that up. That, that'd be a level. good place to start. Check your air cleaner. Make sure that whole air intake housing is intact and clean. sealed up correctly. Shop back to clean out yep. the leaves. You just check all that out and then and then take it for a run again. Now, I, if you would have had a check engine light on, I'm guessing you would have said something. You, you, have you had a check engine light come on? I haven't noticed that. Okay. No, I haven't noticed that. Yep. So something's within range. And we haven't said this yet. And I don't want to go there, but I, I, you just got to keep it in mind. If, if the vehicle's in a good state of health and it's tuned right, running right, then you might think, okay, is this transmission having a hard time holding the, that gear? And so it's hunting between gears, trying to find a comfortable place to land. At least he's got that thing where we just don't get calls about them. Not as many. We, we don't replace them. We've only replaced like two of these ever. Yeah. So, so it's just, it's a, least, it's a least likely culprit. And if it was if it was jumping in between, that's something you got to just at least keep on the list somewhere. All right, does that help you out, Steve? Okay, it sure does. Makes me feel better about making a trip. All right, <laughs> take care. <laughs> Thank you. You bet. See ya. All right, we're gonna jump right over, and we're gonna get right back into it with Dustin with the 2003 Tundra. How you doing? Oh, not too bad. How you doing, Russ? Uh, well, but. You're calling us, so you've got something wrong with that Tundra. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a recently retired friend of mine. I'm just trying to help him out. All right. So but we're all good. Uh, so uh, he had a brake line go bad. Okay. One of the rear ones back by the portioning valve. So he got three lines from Toyota, the short one that goes over the spare, and then the two long ones that run along that frame rail. I put them in, and I bled the system out. I'm just wondering if you guys have seen where that ABS module can hide some air in there. Oh, that's yeah. a pretty common thing you know, for that particular truck. Yeah, we can. And and sometimes, you know, if you if you're if you can't get the rear blood out real well, you might try the front. You know, open even though you never had sure. it open, open the front just a little bit, like crack crack the two lines open just to, so they're just dripping a little bit, not f completely flowing open. And then step on that pedal with the rear open a little bit to try to recenter the proportioning valve. And then before you let the pedal up, close all the lines on it and see if you can get it to switch. Because what will happen is whichever side has the least amount of pressure, that valve is going to close off that side thinking that there's a break in a line. And then you only have pressure mm -hmm. to the front. So if you trick it to make the front think that there's a leak, then it can recenter itself and you can get the back to open air to move out and fluid to go through it and makes it work again. Ancient sure. rust well, secret. I've got, 
I've gotten actually all four wheels to push uh, solid fluid through. And then so what's happening is the master cylinder feels like it's pushing through maybe the front brakes and it's, it's activating the rear. I can hear it activating the rear brakes and I'm getting solid fluid, but it's almost like maybe the master cylinder has gone bad because they ran it without brake fluid too long. Well, that's possible. Uh, I mean, you might try. There's an ABS module up on that fender there. That I just wonder if that's so high that maybe it's hiding oh, here inside of it. Definitely. So what you want to do next is if it's got pretty good brakes where you can stop, uh, you know, quickly if you need to, but they're just don't feel right. Go out and get on some dirt gravel yep, okay. and, and hammer on the brakes where it's safe to do so. Do that like 20, 30 times or so to get the ABS pump to activate and run. And when it does yeah. that and fills the accumulator, it might push the air through it. Then try to bleed it. And if you bleed it and you get air out of it again, do, do that again a few times and you can just bleed it right at the, at the ABS pump, try to crack the line there when you bleed it. And if you're getting air, just keep running it that way. If you had a scan tool that could activate that, you could activate it and bleed them while the scan tool. Well then kick the pump on and open the inlet and outlet valves on it and see if you can get air out of that thing. Okay. That, that might help. We've done that. Um, and got the, the master cylinders to, or, you know, bled them out enough where we didn't have to replace the master cylinder. So. Right. So when I do activate that uh, ABS module, how what, what do I uh, loosen up to get the air out of it? Don't, so I got to activate it and then we can see that. Right. Activate it first, turn it off, and then bleed it out manually. Don't open it while the pump's running. From the, from the calipers or right. from, the, from the module itself. Right next to the from module. The calipers, Crack okay. them open there and try to bleed it oh, there. Oh, okay. The old-fashioned right. way. I'll at try the, that. Yep. Step on the pedal okay. and open them. All right. Take care. Sure. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. All right. We're going to jump right over to Blaine in California with a 17 Ridge line. What can we do for you, Blaine? Hey, um, I, I had an interesting experience. I, I've, I've had a lot of Hondas, never had any trouble with the automatic uh, temperature, so it'd be having trouble. But on this Ridge line, all of a sudden, I wasn't getting any real temperature control. I had to turn it all the way to high or all the way to low to get appreciable change. And I just don't know where, where to begin to kind of puzzle it out. If you've got to turn it all the way to high or all the way to low to get it go going, uh, two things could be happening. It sounds to me like maybe your the blend door control motor in there that controls the hot to cold, the, that heat door, is failing in between and it can't get a good reading until it gets to one end or the other. It may be dead in between. And that that's happens. We see that. And we've put a few of them in. We've got a postal customer with a, a ridge line like this. And she had this issue where we had to put a new, we had to put two or three, I think in over the years now in 130,000 miles um, that can do it. And then the other thing we found is just simply disconnecting the battery on that for about 10 minutes and hooking it back up and then don't touch that control. It'll try to recalibrate itself by going from one end to the other and relearning. And sometimes that will fix the problem without putting a part on it. It'll just relearn okay. all those positions because it counts, you know, from zero on up and then back and forth. So it knows exactly what position, but if it doesn't learn it, it can't work. So before you replace a part, you might start by just cal trying to calibrate it, get it to do a self calibration and see if that fixes your problem. Yeah, and how, how big of a job is it to get into that Lindor motor? If I remember right, I can, you can do that one in less than an hour on that one. Oh, wow. And that's if you're not sure, you can look it up in a repair manual uh, online and see somebody that's done it or just see what they show for the operation uh, in somebody's repair manual if they'll let you see it. That's uh, a lot of times where you'll be able to see if it says 0.5 or if it says 11. Yeah, <laughs> hope for not 11. Does that help you out? Well, yeah, you helped me out a lot. All I, right. Well, I've done uh, in-depth in stuff before. I replaced a, a, a heater core on my old Volvo 740. That Ooh. was a pain in the rear. Oh, you're you're you're, you're uh, made for this. All right. Yeah. <laughs> we got to take a break. Thanks, Thanks for the call. Take care. Bye. 866-594-4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show, brought to you by Sturdivant's. Eight 
866-594. Did I say 8666? No, you had it. It just was quick and different. Yeah, stop. 866-594-4150. Yeah. Our producer was greatly appreciative when I give the right number. That is the number for Under the Hood. Give us a call, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you. Or we won't. I mean, we usually most, do, though. most of the time we do. Yeah, we usually choose to do that. So. It's rare that we don't. So, um, Like right now, we're going to jump in. We're going to talk to Chris in Mississippi with a 2002 Corvette or a Chevette. I don't know. Producer Doug just has vet up there. So, is it a Chevette or a Corvette? Big difference. Oh, no, two, it oh, two, it's a Corvette. Corvette. Yeah, I had this hot date, and I told her I'd drive a vet, and she says, I can't wait. And Chris showed up in his 79 Chevette. Ooh. That could be a – that's a collector now, yeah, though. Well, so. they're, the clean one's a classic now, you bet. <laughs> What's up with your car? Well, I, I have a – I wouldn't call the problem just a situation where bought this car, love it, no problems with it, wanted to get the transmission fluid flushed on it, mm-hmm. and no one will touch it because it's a 2002 with 50,000 miles on it. And I guess the issue is there are times when the fluid has been replaced, the transmission goes bad, or they've had people bringing vehicles in knowing they had a problem transmission and then try to blame the dealership or whoever you bring it to. So my question is, do I change the fluid or not? I have no problems with the, with the vehicle at all. It's beautiful. I love it. Runs like a champ. But the 2002 with original transmission fluid in it. You know, an O2 original fluid, if the fluid's not burnt, if it's just a little off red, my guess is I can picture this car. It's probably not bright red anymore, but it's probably a, a little bit reddish orange, but not burnt yet. In that case, with 50,000 miles, I'm going to flush it. Yeah, and that's a, that's a 4L60 tranny in there. It's, just, it's the same transmission as they put in the pickups and everything yeah. else. Correct, it, Russ? I mean, that's yeah, not any different. Yeah, it's, it's, yes. it, it, I'd say do it, and then you're probably good for the rest of the life that you have that car. I just had a, one of our good customers bring me a, uh, what was it, an 80, 87 or 88, I think it was, Camaro. And he said, clean the injectors, flush the trans, and something happened to our trans machine, our brand new one we just got, so I couldn't do it. Well, it kind of worked out, kind of weird karma. He picked the car up and he says, I'll just do it in the spring. He got like two miles from the shop and the transmission went out. Oh my gosh. So he went, oh. he went to a place where he was at and just asked, well, you know, can we rebuild it? And yeah, and it's going to be expensive. But if we would have flushed it, it probably would have gone out on the test drive after we flushed it. And we would have been going, why? That's never happened. Uh, not, and the fluid looked like brand new in this car. It was still really nice. It just was age related. It just happened that it was its time, so it can go out. But what you want to avoid is if you have it at a shop and the fluid is burnt and black, don't don't flush it because you, you're you going to have to put a trans in it anyway. So, okay. mm-hmm. But I think you're fine. I, I'd, if it was mine, I'd, I'd flush this thing out. Go to, a, go to a mainline transmission shop and in, that does transmission work for a living, no. and they, you know, uh-huh. they might be a little uh, less touchy about that whole liability piece than, yep. than a dealership maybe a dealership's probably had a recent event mm-hmm. they've probably been burned a few times oh yeah and so they're well, just people they're, do they're right. just, purpose they're they're touchy about it so i i would say you know flush that trans and the other thing i would do that'd be important on this car change the rear differential fluid it's pretty old and it's cheap to do that. that yep get that done Did and then do uh, yeah. um we've got change the um both the flush the engine coolant and put a new motorad thermostat in it motorad's one of our partners and we use them because they'll hold the temp a lot steadier on those but oh okay tr- definitely uh all right you know if you're flushing coolant it, you, you got to put a thermostat mm-hmm. in it because you're going to be draining it anyways and that's the easiest time mm-hmm. to put a thermostat in and, and like i said the motorad ones have worked really good for us because that when they fail they fail open as well so they don't burn your car up um uh, but flush right. it because the, the coolant will become acidic with age. And as it mm-hmm. does, it can eat up head gaskets and heater cores. You don't have to worry so much about the freezing where you're at. Just sometimes, you know, if you get really cold. Right. But uh, definitely the acidity in there you want to clean out. And that acidity can eat up thermostats as well. That's why we say get those things changed. But, yeah, I think you're good to go. Flush the trans, 
thermostat, flush the coolant, drive it, enjoy it. Fantastic. Thank you. And, and, and it's not a Chevette. It is a Corvette. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, we, we're, we're pretty happy to hear that because I think they quit making those like in 1985 or six or somewhere Do in you there. you remember the call Shannon a decade or so ago and the guy said, ah, I just picked up this great Park Avenue. It's That thing's a chick magnet. It's like, what's the demographics of the chicks? Oh, you know, 60s to 70 <laughs> year old <laughs> women. <laughs> yeah, that's a chick magnet. All right. Take care, Chris. It is. Thank you very much. Take care, guys. See ya. All right. Right back to the phones to Jim with a 2015 Taurus. Hello, Jim. Good morning. How can we help you? Have you got me? We do. Well, I got a, yeah, I got the 2015 Taurus, uh, my daughter's car, but, uh, the, uh, radio doesn't have any audio on it. Um, I've, Everything else works. It'll take commands for the navigation and and everything else. But it started out as a crackling and popping in the speakers. And I've read some stuff about the audio control module and that that type of thing. But I'm just wondering what you guys would suggest. We've replaced a number of them for this very problem. You go down the road, you hit bumps, and they just start crackling. Or even just sitting there and park in the driveway, they'll start crackling. And it seems like the audio control units in many cars from about 14 and newer cars and trucks were built a lot more cheaply than some of the previous versions. We had audio problems before that going back a number of years. And then there were some like bulletproof radios in between. But when we hit 14 to 15 is when a lot of car systems dramatically changed and when they did we started seeing a lot of radio problems and then in about 2022 to 3 we saw another big change with electronics in cars and we're not seeing problems with those yet but they're we're pretty seeing, they're pretty fresh yeah, yet though, we got Russ. a whole new line of yeah. pro- stuff failing in other vehicles but we would see these when they were a couple years old start to fail so yeah if you've got a shop that takes a look at it and they tell you that it's an audio control unit it's very plausible that's what the problem is Okay, is there, uh, I mean, are these things matched to the radio? Can you just go to a, a salvage yard or a recycle mm-hmm. yard as you got to have it and pick one up? Or how do you? For you sure. You can put in a, a certified used recycled unit and have it programmed, and that will work. We do that often. Uh, not a problem in a, in a Ford product like that. It's a, a bolt in and then reprogram or it won't operate it's got to match the vin number of the car and of course the options on the car they even have an equalizer built into it in the programming to equalize it for the vehicle it's put into as a opposed to a car versus a truck because they use the same component in a lot of different vehicles right so yeah it can be done and that is going to save you a lot of money compared to what a brand new one can cost there are times when a new one might be cheaper but in this case and a lot of others, no, it's, you, you, you really, you owe it to yourself to look at all the options first and do what fits the pocketbook the best. And this used ones, they can carry, so used products will typically carry in on average, and we buy literally thousands a year, uh, we'll see warranties at a minimum of six months and up to two years. That's, that's pretty common. Uh, there's a few out there still that are they're shooting themselves in the foot by offering no warranty. When, or 30 days or 90 yeah. days, real short warranty. But it's more and more common to see used parts with year warranties on them, at least. So just do some checking around, and and uh, I would go that route. Okay. You guys say you do it. She's in Sioux Falls with this oh, car. I'm just that's a, is that something? That's a close area to us. That's something that, uh, that they would perform out at. Oh, I said that. That's we. Maybe me. I don't know. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah. Someone on the team. You know, it, it amazes how many people don't even know that we have a shop. I had somebody the other day that said, ah, you radio guys, you don't, you don't work on cars. What are you thinking? And I'm like, Russ how long is, you uh, listen to the show? Russ's purple fingernails first from show. getting smashed and cut hands would tell yeah. you differently. A uh, guy was like, this is my first show. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Give us a call. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Is there, is there a, uh, yeah, you bet. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I think, yeah, Jim had something else to say, but I th- maybe you got it. He'll call me. Five nine four two two one one. He was going to ask a phone number. 
Cut. <laughs> Doug, cut that out of the national show, please. Uh, local's fine. Um, Jim. Jim in Rhode Island with an 86 Pontiac. We're going to, what do you think, Shannon? Is it a Fiero or a Firebird? 86 Pontiac. I, you know I'm, what we would do? I'm you going you know, out on a limb, a 6,000. What do you think? I would, seriously was just going to say that it would be fun really? if this was a 6,000 STE. Or maybe a Bonneville with yeah. the new dash. What is it, Jim? What kind of car do you have? This is an 86 Pontiac Caribbean station wagon. Oh, oh wow. we wouldn't have guessed that one. Holy smokes. The Parisian. You guys are way off. Yeah, the big, the big cruiser wagon. My aunt had a, a, one yeah. of these, but it was the four-door. I remember this car well. Does it have the gauge on the dash for the fuel mileage that jumps up and down when you give it gas? Yes, it does. All right. We had yep. one of we had a four door that my mom and dad had in high school that my buddies and I did a lot of cruising in the eighty six or seven Pontiac Parisian. So yeah, what's going on with the Parisian? Well, cars been in the family since probably eighty nine when my dad bought it, and he died a few years later, and the car's been sitting ever since. And it's moved from parking lot and driveway every couple of years, and then it sat for about fifteen years and did nothing, and. I got a phone call from a group that I do some uh, some work with, a charity group, volunteer group, and they want me to bring this along with a couple of my other cars to a um, charity um, car event they're going to have later this summer. So I need to get it running. And the car runs. I, I, I had it running two years ago. Um, drained all the fluids. Um, everything was fine. Turned the motor over by hand uh, about 10, 15 times just to get everything moving a little bit. Started it up. And, uh, and it starts up and runs, um, which is great. It just runs a little rough. So aside from that, I could have replaced all the brake lines because they're kind of rusted out at this point from just sitting all that time. So the brake lines, the transmission lines, I want to replace those. I want to drain and flush the, trans- the, uh, the transmission, replace the radiator. But when it comes to the engine, I want to replace the, uh, the carburetor in the distributor. Um, it's got that old um, Electric. electronic module that controls the two of them. Yeah. And so I wanted to pull those off and just go something maybe, a little, I guess, a little bit older with, with you know, kind of just a new distributor um, and eliminate that electric module that's in there. Is that something that's doable on that engine or is that going to cause me trouble? No, it'll actually, it'll, it'll actually run just fine if you, if you take the distributor out and you put in a standard HEI and you replace the carburetor yeah. with, a, with an aftermarket, you know, Edelbrock or something like that, that just, just to feed it fuel and, and get around the 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 computer it it can be done they do sell that electronic feedback carburetor yet you can still buy that as a complete unit and drop back in it uh the biggest problems they had besides the carburetor itself was the oxygen sensor would fail on those cars but it, they they made a when they were working properly they made a significant difference in fuel mileage but if you just if you just want to drive this thing and you don't operate it that much and you're putting new parts on a new HEI to eliminate the problem you're going to have with the module in the bottom of it and the pickup coil and a, and a new carburetor without the feedback would, would work as long as they're not doing an emissions inspection in your state on an 86. They may be doing it on newer cars, but sometimes they pass on the... Is that a 5-liter 305 Chevy or the uh, some of those have the 307 Olds in them? I, I got the uh, old 307 in it. Okay, so that, um, that makes it a... I mean, the carburetor is still not a problem, but just you're going to have to look a little different for the, for the distributor. Uh, a lot of times you think it's just the small block Chevy and those distributors, there's plenty of, plenty of copies around, but the Oldsmobile ones can be a little more, just Buick, not as normal, but there's Coles Pontiac. Yeah, yeah. They, they make them, um, just the same, Yep. but, um, that's, yeah, we've done yep. that a number of times, gotten rid of that stuff and just went back to the good old HEI and found ourselves a Holly or a Carter or a. Elder Edelbrock carburetor that was a, a nice CFM that matched up and back it, in the days that would uh, that would take care of all that extra headache. Well, all right, cool. Yeah, I'm not worried about the emissions in Rhode Island. I don't have to worry about that. The car sure. registered as a uh, as an antique, and with the antique vehicles, we don't even do safety inspections on them. So oh, sure. Just, does it have? They let you drive it. Right? Does it have wood wood grain? I do. <laughs> oh wow! And it is let, Russ, let's guess a color here. This is just a this is a classic now. I think it's going to be like a blue with wood grain. Ah, uh, silver. What no, we, you got it right on. It's blue. Blue. Oh, there you go. I can picture this. They were they weighed about 
6,500 pounds. <laughs> no, no, they didn't. And they're underpowered. They're lighter than you think. I think it's 3625. Oh, it's not a Parisian. Same, same as the Delta. Oh, we're going to have oh, to look wagon. this up. Yeah, the wagon's a, more. We're going to have to look that up. The four-door was in the thir- like 3625. Same no, as Delta 88, no, the Trans Am. No. This is well, a full frame. Yep. Um, yep. We got a good debate going. We're going to look it up. Good, we're going to look gonna it up on the internet. All right. Take care, Jim. All right. Thanks, guys. See you. Are feeling ill? Don't want to spread it to your wallet? Call the Motor Medics now for free advice. Welcome back to the Under the Hood Show. Under the Hood, Russ, Shannon, Chris. Sans Chris today, but the rest of us are here. Thanks for joining us. We're uh, we're going to answer the burning question about what the weight was of that Pontiac Parisienne we just talked about, because I was certain it was less, but my only guess was because in my head I was comparing it to a 79 Olds 88 we had, which was almost identical to a Firebird Trans Am. And you would think there's no way that that big old boat can weigh the same as that car. But how much does the Parisian weigh, Shannon? The Parisian wagon weighed, according to the my quick searching, was 4,101 pounds curb weight without the driver. The Parisian sedan was 3,800 pounds, something without the driver. So Russ was really darn close at his 3,600 pounds, and I was way off at my 6,000-pound exaggeration. That's a big, well, you think those cars are heavy. I was always under the assumption that the car we had just had a bigger engine or something than well, a they, Firebird. They, they apparently, the, they learned, the you know, and now when you think about the construction as we dismantled them, they had lightened them up considerably the way the fenders were made, the way the doors were made. Oh, from, plastic from the, fender from liners. The, from the previous generation. So in the 80s, we're, we're in a fuel crunch, and they were trying to lighten everything up. So that does make sense. All right. We're going to jump in here and talk to Conrad with a 2009 Yukon. How are you doing, Conrad? Yeah, fine. How can, uh, we, how can we help you? Here. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's me. Uh, I got a 2009 Yukon, and uh, in the morning, there's times when uh, the rear hatch door will, in the morning, I look out and it's closed, but as I'm working in the kitchen here, I look out again, it'll pop open. Oh, it actually opens by it, itself. Yeah, and then also um, uh, the passenger, rear passenger um uh, 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 window will roll down by itself. Okay. Okay. At times driving down the road. Well, what, what we've seen happen on this model vehicle specifically, we've seen the nine and the tens. We've seen a couple of them do weird stuff like that. And so far it's been the body control module that failed. They just do weird stuff inside and start going crazy on us. And they, we have, uh, you know, had windows go up and down by themselves we've had uh you know all sorts of stuff like that so it's possible uh, that that's what's going on and then and it's oh. not it's not unusual for you know those things it would be unusual for those things to fail to the point where they're activating devices uh that that is not real normal not but normal it, but, but, but it we've does had happen. It happen yeah we've had hatches pop open going down the road when you're sitting there parked and also windows just roll down. I've come out and people said, yeah, all my windows went down every one of them. So because there's no real good correlation in the circuit that pops the hatch loose and the one right. that rolls the windows down. Right. You know, so, is in, in the, you don't have a, a switch that combines those two or anything like that, where a switch could be crossing. It's coming from the command center, which would be the body control module that everything runs through up onto the driver's side of the dash. So that's, that's what we would look at and, you know, have a shop, take a look at that. But we, we think that's probably what's going on with it. And that has to be replaced and reprogrammed, uh, to match the vehicle. Cause it's gotta no, be it's not, not just replacing it. Huh? Right. No. It's gotta be programmed, which isn't a big deal anymore. People used to always get, Oh, it's gotta be programmed. That's a huge deal. But if you have someone that has the right capability sc- yeah. scanner that you know to be able to do that uh, that's not a subscription required thing or anything is it yes Russ? It, is. it is okay yep. all right gotta have a subscription for that one can you do a la carte on an older one like that in a, in a repair shop or do you do you have it as it's a, one for the whole vehicle yeah for two years you get a two-year subscription when you buy it so it'll cover that vehicle for that long yeah so you got that opportunity so you find somebody that already has that subscription and then they can they can not have to charge you much as as much as if somebody had to go right out and buy it to do the work <laughs> 
Oh, so, yeah, we got computers. I got the, I don't know what's the name of the computer to hook up to vehicles. Yeah, it's more than trucks and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, uh, I'm trying to think of what the name is. Well, that snap uh, on and those have computers and all tell, but those won't program the vehicle. They just explain the difference quickly. Russ. Well, they read codes. You've got code scanners to read the vehicles. There's a hundred manufacturers or so yeah. of those. Out read there, codes, read data, computer. but then there's one from GM that uses their service programming system and, uh, logs in and with the tech connect and it programs your your vehicle so the most common way an independent's going to do that or not one of the ways is they would have either a a software cable that they would have hooked to a pc to be able to do that or else if you have the the, if you do have a writable scanner then or you can have a subscription that you've got on that device already and that sounds like you might have something like that maybe you're 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 kind of well i i do have mine is a pretty expensive computer i have to pay like a couple grand a year to read to to update it so that could be it, it it could be that it's got that option to reprogram uh or, or something like that but then uh, in the meantime i got another question here i was at a, at a farm show here and they got some some additive heavy duty vehicle lubrication sure. additive justice brothers uh what do you think what do you think about them is that just a synthetic additive that they add or is it actually well, just more special it's a it's a good additive. We're gonna have to carry you over to the after show in a second here because we only got a few seconds left. But you just stay right where you're at, and we're gonna be right back with you in just a second. Oh wait, we are right back again. So you had a question, Conrad. You had a question about additives in the heavy duty vehicle, the Justice Brothers heavy duty vehicle, and what that additive does is provide. It's a friction modifier which helps reduce the friction in your gearboxes and in engine oil, and it lowers the temperature of those units by um, by reducing the friction. So it, it does help quite a bit. We actually use it in our own vehicles. Um, the stuff we've used for towing, like we've got an old 49 GMC that has had some newer parts, more like yours on there, um, installed in the drivetrain, and it significantly lowered our towing temperatures in the transmission and the rear end of that vehicle, um, and even in the engine oil temperature, just by having that additive in there and uh, driving with it in there. We put it in at every oil change when we change it. I think it's time to change that again. But uh, How yeah. much do you put in, like in a Yukon? Uh, just, uh, it shows on uh, the bottle, uh, and it's it's ounces per oh. quart of, okay. of uh, space. So read the, read the bottle, and it'll tell you how many ounces per quart that you – you add into the the engine oil or the gearbox transmission things like that to in order to protect it. you don't want too much in there or too, or too little how uh, what do you think about the jb i guess there's all kinds of brands out there but what do you think about the jb model jb brand that is one of the products we've been using in our own shop for a number of years about oh. 15 years or so and the jb okay yep, justice brothers products and it's been very good for us it's available primarily at uh, professional service centers like ours. Not so much at retail, although you can find some retail stores around will have some stuff like Menards and things. You can find some of their products there. And I believe uh, Fleet Farm and things, there, there'll be some there you'll find on the shelves, but you'll see it. A lot of those places have service centers too, other than Menards, you know. So uh, so would, it, uh, uh, would you gain fuel mileage, gas mileage? You can. Uh, depending on how you drive, what you're pulling and all that stuff, anytime you reduce friction, you are going to reduce drag and increase your fuel economy. So while you can't just expect to pour something in and magically get a lot of miles per gallon, yeah, anything you can do to reduce the drag that you're adding by putting something on like a trailer or, or driving harder, that, that makes a lot of difference. How much temperature difference would you say you gained in transmissions? Well, I can tell you on on ours, we had a transmission that was, uh, it dropped about 25 degrees in towing and the rear end. 25 degrees. Yeah, the rear end dropped about 20 when we were pulling a a big trailer. That was a lot because we were pulling a big trailer and it was getting so hot that I could smell the oil starting to burn a little bit out the vent. And when we put that in, it dropped our temperatures significantly so I wasn't smelling it anymore. Well. So in a transmission, you're talking of draining 
if once a year, that's a lot probably, huh? So doesn't it use its, um, lose its, uh, its, um, you have to add, or why would you? Yeah, you have to put the additive in every time you change fluid. So if you drain fluid and refill it, you've got to put the additive in again. But I mean, you don't drain a transmission. Well, with an engine oil, you drain it a lot more often. But right. like with with a transmission and no, a differential, it doesn't lose. But it strength. still have a good effect even after years if you don't drain it. Correct. Yep. It'll it'll treat the metal, not the oil, so it'll last in there for a very long time until it's flushed out again and then it'll still provide some protection but it provides more when it's actually active in the fluid hmm. so so does it make a difference if the oil is synthetic or no. or regular oil no no everything made today it mixes is in either one yeah everything's okay. made to mix equally with with both of course always read the the product bottle of anything you're putting in your vehicle just to make sure but Typically now everything that's made from every company is, is designed to work with today's vehicles or they'll tell you specifically that it's not. How about in a Mercedes diesel van, like in the Sprinter vans, would you recommend it in that too then? In the yeah, diesel engine? you can, you can, in that you'd use, uh, use that in the, in the rear end for sure. You'd have to check on the other parts to be, to be sure you have to get on the internet and look it up and look on the bottle and see what it says. Cause some of those require different things. They can be, they're their own animal. A Mercedes, the Sprinters, and the Promasters, they're, they like certain things a certain way. So, I, uh, so you don't think it's a good idea to just put it in? And I wouldn't just it. put it in one of those until I know for sure exactly what I'm, you know, what, what, what Mercedes is asking for on those because they've got enough problems without <laughs> changing stuff around. Well, it, it's a uh, it's quite an engine. I mean, for oh, yeah. gas mileage, it, it it does it goes it does better gas mileage. That one ton dual band of better mileage than my Yukon. Yep, yeah, they uh, they do pretty good, except for the wind. They don't like wind at all. They'll give you the high wind warning if it gets too crazy. But they do get pretty good fuel mileage. That's why you see so many of them out there. Yeah, um, with, without wind, they definitely get just as good a fuel mileage as, as my. 09 Suburban, then all newer ones are probably a little better, but yeah, it's just, um, you can get, you can average 17 on long trips. That's it's quite, it's quite impressive the, what they've got going on there, but Mercedes Benz is always, you know, at the, you know, the, the, the pinnacle and uniqueness of their engineering. And so when we get into some of those high end German, they have specific fluids that they use right from the get go. When you, when you, even when you do a flush, you have to use a specific fluid. So we really are careful about mixing additives or extras in those without first consulting. So definitely a good question to ask on that one. We appreciate your call. It sounds like you get some good stuff going on. Hopefully we helped you out with that Yukon. Thank you. But take care. Have a good day guys. You too. Bye. All right. We're going to, uh, uh we're going to ch- go over here to Steve with a 99 suburban radio. Hello, Steve. How are you doing today? We're good. How's your radio doing? <laughs> well, not so great. And I know you. I've heard you guys discuss the problem on numerous occasions with amplifier issues, and that's what I think I probably have going on. Mm-hmm. But I'm just double checking. So it's 99 diesel, really basic model. I believe the amplifier is just part of the radio on it, that. It is in a 99. Um, they unless, like I said, they did. Okay. They didn't put the Bose option in until they went to the next generation of Suburban. Mm-hmm. So you have a pretty yep. straightforward deal there with the radio. Okay. So I've, I've, uh, I've put a few used radios in. I've had this vehicle bought I don't know, around a dozen years. Don't put a lot of miles on it, but the radio seemed to go bad more often than anything. I put a few used ones in, and then maybe a year, less than two years ago, I put a refurbished radio in that actually has it. Bluetooth connection, which is working you, great, but you? sorry, I got my background radio there, sorry about that, but, so I thought the refurbished one would hopefully take care of my problems more long term, but I guess maybe they did some other stuff and like stole an original amplifier from the late 90s. Well, one of the things you might consider, you know, if you've been having the factory radios fail, and it's, you know, like I said, with you, if you don't find a refurbished radio, which is out there, I know like Dorman and others offer some of those for a lot of models. Then they add in the Bluetooth yeah. and they add in the different things, which is really a nice feature. You might just consider getting a kit from someone like our friends at Audio Playground. We know them down there really well, the good friends of ours, and getting a 
sure. you can get a pretty nice aftermarket radio from what like brands like Pioneer and different oh, places. Pioneer Alpine, they make some really great in dash units. Some of them even have a big TV screen on them for Apple CarPlay and all that interacted right into the radio, and they can you know a few hundred sure. bucks even on. You can update those. to a some more modern technology and plug it right into that same connections with the adapter sure. kit, and uh, that'd be something uh, to, something to consider. Yeah, I wasn't sure if those, you know, generally came with the amplifier. I don't know if models have a face or whatever. No, they make a but they make one with in. an amplifier built in just for these types of applications for sure. You know, otherwise they're, of course, well known for all their fun stuff where you put in separate sure. amplifiers and really make it thump. You could take that ninety nine Suburban and turn it into a major <laughs> radio show vehicle if you wanted to fill the back with subwoofers. Yeah. And I, I've seen those Suburban Tahoes and stuff where people have spent tens of thousands of dollars and 12 made a, 18 inch woofers yeah, and, and, and 12 made alternators something and, that could take the hearing out of an entire school room of children you know so yeah well i might go over good with my daughters but I don't think we'll go, <laughs> go quite that far <laughs> all right well that's probably what i look at this time because like i said the the originally fact ones have been lasting long term for me and all right and, and they'll i don't know i mean i know if you've discussed it before and it'll it'll go out and i'll suddenly hit a bump just right or whatever and it'll come back and work for a few more days or whatever but all right thanks steve i will probably go the aftermarket route thanks a lot guys you Appreciate bet you. take care all right we're gonna jump over to a guy who has the ultimate chick magnet how you doing roger good yeah i've had several of these chick magnets i've got a 98 right now when i first got it the guy told me he could press with a defroster floor vent and it wouldn't move off a vent. So I pulled that actuator off and I got it to go on defroster. But when I pulled that actuator off, the metal part stayed on that. Now, <clears throat> there you look on the internet and there's a left and a right. Yep. That's not for that one, is it? No, if, it's, if it just has so one what? temperature control, then it's just a just the left, just one. But that's that's for heat. But if it, you know, the the mode door is what you're looking for. So there's a there's a hot cold, and you can have you'll have one if it's just a single zone. You'll have a left and a right if it's a dual zone. But the mode is always going to be one unit, and it's for foot, face, floor, and our partner over at Dorman okay, Products now makes that's that. Called the mode unit then. Mode, yeah. So if you go if you go into yeah. an AutoZone auto parts store. We use them in our shop when we're when we're looking for parts because we can you know we can call them up and they're going to have some of those. This is getting to be a little older car, so you know their selection's pretty good on those things. And you tell them I want a mode door motor for this ninety eight Park Avenue, and they'll pull it up on their screen and they'll quickly be able to to sh- they can even show you there too. Here's the mode door motor. Here's the blend door for and the temp is blend mode is the mode of the HVAC is that mode face is the mode floor is that mode defrost. That's the one you're looking at is for the mode door motor. And they should have that in a dormant product available for you. No, that, uh, <clears throat> so I moved it by hand and I got, you know, I can put it anywhere I want it. But now when Perfect. I, moved it, I got the defrost is on a little bit of floor, but now my driver's side is thrown cold, dash is cold. So that'd be that right then, uh, the left one then? Yes. The one? If the driver's side is stuck on cold or hot cold. and the passenger side works, but you can move the lever by hand when you take that do- that motor off and make it go hot, cold, that's the blend door motor. If you can't make it go hot, do- cold, it. yeah, if you can swap that thing around by hand, turn it, that's like a plugged heater core. But we don't see a lot of plugged heater cores in the Park Avenues or the Sabres. They're pretty tough. They flow. They've got bigger holes inside yeah. the cores. So, yeah, you could, so it sounds like you might need a mode door motor and a blend door motor. And. and okay, now what, that would be on the left side? They should both. So one of them is on the left side, and it's it's vertically, like up and down. And does this, and mm-hmm. and then you your temp door motor is going to be up there as well. And then on the, but that's, that's flat on the top. Um, then the passenger side, the heat is behind the glove box there. Oh, that's a different than the other one. Yeah, that's the different right side the behind the glove box. 
Yep, and, and if you get called a blend or heat blend door, that's the heat blend door, and then the mode doors on the left. And AutoZone will have both of those. I'll bet they're on the shelf in stock for you. Yeah, too. And they'll probably, you know, if they may have a, di- a diagram you can find on yep. the internet, or they may have one there on their computer to kind of show where it's at. And they're really affordable. I mean, I, you're you're probably going to pick both of them up for under a hundred bucks for the pair of them. That's what we typically see on on those cars. So. Does that help you out a little bit? There is a total of four. There is a total of four actuators, right? Well, yes. You have the left heat, the right heat which are the blend door motors. Then you have the mode door motor. Right. And then your fourth one <laughs> is the, 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 uh, yeah, that's air the inlet. Yeah. That's the air inlet. That takes yeah. a little more. You got to pull the dash back to yeah. get to that one, but that one's usually fine unless right. it goes click, right. click, click when the car's running. So if it doesn't do that, right. ignore right. it. Don't right. fix it. Right. Too much money. Too yeah. much time. Everyone I've had now, I've had, uh, back way door problems, but all yep. right. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. You bet. Take care. All right, we're going to jump back over here to uh, Dave in South Carolina with a 2023 Hyundai Santa Cruz. That thing's brand new. You shouldn't have anything going on with it. What's up with the Santa Cruz? Hey, G- hey gentlemen, thank you for taking my call. So okay. I uh, sustained some rodent damage. I live on the uh, marsh here in South Carolina. The vehicle is parked outside. Um, and I you know, got the, the wire harness under the right passenger fender or fender liner was where the nest and the damage was set up so the car's repaired now running fine but my question was you guys have uh recommended the nh uh, oil undercoating so i bought some of that stuff the peppermint yes uh, sort of lubricant spray to sort of start treating the car as a preventative measure for future uh problems again i'm the car's parked. We live on the marsh. We have a lot of marsh rats and squirrels and things like that. You in the Outer My Banks? My question is, what? You in the Outer Banks? Uh, no, we're in, I'm in Charleston, Charleston, Char- South Carolina. I got a friend there that just that moved there from here about four years ago. He loves it. He says it's his favorite part of the well, favorite place he's ever lived. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's wonderful, but sh- don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting crowded. <laughs> That's how he got there. Somebody told him. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So my question is, where should I be applying this uh, spray to the vehicle now? Because obviously the rodents are attracted to the wiring, and you don't want to go blasting wiring with a bunch of oil, I don't believe. So should I just be hitting the suspension elements of the car to try to prevent them from climbing up the wheel wells? I kind of a thing, if you had any thoughts. Myself, I put it on the wiring. I put it on the outside of the, the, on the harnesses because the wires are inside of the harness, but where you see that they're going to chew through, I put it, I put it in the areas you think that they would go to. Cause if, if you put it around the area, they're typically not going to go into the area. So if they're, if they're coming up onto the engine, they're not going to search around and say, ah, that doesn't taste like peppermint. Let's chew over here. They usually say, ah, this is not where I want to be because it's got some other predatory animal uh, smell in there too. So they're like, I don't want to be here. And they try to get out, but you could start by, by putting it in air, just on the, like the pads of the firewall and stuff in there. It's going to stay on that for a long time, that cardboard and stuff under the hood. It'll stay with that a long okay. time. And, um, NH oil undercoating is, is also a, a really good company for helping you out. If you have questions, you can go online to their website and you can ask them questions there. And if they'll also point you in the direction of a local applier, um, if they have one right in your area that can answer those questions as well. So, cause they're always looking for people to do, to open up NH oil undercoating franchises that have mobile apply units and stuff too. Cause you know, with their rust proofing and the, the rodent, the, the mouse out, I use that on my camper and I use it on the suspension area because everything's inside. I just want them to keep from going from the ground up to it in the winter so i spray the jacks and the suspension and i i usually put that on a, a couple times in the fall when i put it away and then i i put it in later and then even in the spring too because it sits outside so i want to make sure that it so far it's kept them away but the, the rodents those things are awful they just chew everything <laughs> well what's interesting it is my daily driver and the car sits idle you know, maybe for two nights, you know, a Friday, it. Saturday night, otherwise the drive, but they, uh, 
yeah, they managed to do eight hundred dollars worth of damage uh, over a weekend. So yeah, and that's cheap. They get it gets much worse than that. We've had some that have been totaled by insurance companies because of that. But they look for a place that's warm. So if you get a night where it's it's cooling off even into the like low sixties, they'll look for a place to nest for the night. And the first thing they do when they curl up is they start chewing on stuff to make a nest and 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 mm-hmm. eat it. And uh, they'll they'll destroy a car quickly. It's usually doesn't take people. Some people think it takes like a month of storage, but they can literally get in there and do damage in 20 minutes. They just, they go, okay, this is where I'm going. All right, here we go. And they'll start chewing away. I hate those things. Well, and when they've got some of these harnesses that are integral through, you know, they go through the whole dashboard and inside the vehicle, that's where you get in trouble. I mean, there's, and you got data wires and things that can't be spliced as easily in, in a lot of newer vehicles. So it, it's a real issue. So our partners at NH oil undercoating of, you know, they've got a product there that, uh, is there's a need for it in the market there. Mm-hmm. That is for sure. Does that help you out, Dave? All right. Well, thank you. I pre- Yeah. I you appreciate bet. your guidance and, uh, come see us here in Charleston sometime. Well, I'm going to be, I had an invitation there from, uh, Greg and the guys out there and I said, you know what? I got to, I'm, I'm going to be coming out there before too long. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right. We're going to jump right back to the phone again, and we're going to talk to Richard with a 2017 Kia Sportage. How you doing, Richard? Oh, good. How are you? We're all right. Where are you at, good. Richard? Thanks for taking my call. You bet. I am right now in, I'm right now in South Dakota, but I live in uh, Rochester, Minnesota. Rochester, Minnesota. All right. How can we help you with the so Sportage? I'm a truck driver, so I'm way out here. Well, I got a 2017 Kia Sportage. I bought it with uh, 12,000 miles about four years ago, and it's got uh, only about 54,000 miles on it now. I was just curious. I've been listening to you guys, and I wonder, is there anything that you guys know about a Kia Sportage 2.0 Turbo that I could probably want to keep that? Or is there anything down the road, 80,000 miles, that uh, you know about that? I would just yeah yeah no I would just make sure that with any of these Kia Hyundai products these later model ones you know when they work and they run and they're doing their thing they're they've they've proven to be very popular and great vehicles by a club but but just yeah popular that way seriously take a uh, a very keen liking to your maintenance though on your engine oil Uh, changes oil changes and the correct oils and do it. Do it at oh, yeah. uh, that 3,000 to 4,000 mile mark and just stay yeah. after it. And even if you're not driving it yeah. a lot, uh, then pick yourself like a, yeah. an interval of you know, six months or something like that, uh, eight months, okay. just to make sure you're doing it. Because they just, we just want people to take their best chances. When they do break, they're quite expensive yes, to, yeah. get, to get engines for. And we because see they're them, popular. Oh, yeah. And we see them break a little more than yeah. they should. The other thing I would recommend is that if you have the opportunity when you're driving it with that little turbo engine and you see the the fuel yeah. that's got the maybe the 89 octane or or uh, you don't have to go yeah. all the way to 91 but just feed it a little extra octane or the ethanol blended fuel just if not you're 87 in your area. Uh, try to low. give try to yeah. give it a little more octane because that engine will be a lot happier all the time the way it runs with that little turbo uh, yep. with, with a little more octane oh it would it be good even with 91 it'd be good right oh if yeah you, if you want to pay for it yeah yeah if definitely and the fuel's yeah, going down a little bit. It used to be 10 cents more than, you know, mid-grade, mid-grade with 10 cents more than unleaded. Now it's like a buck more. Yep. <laughs> yep. And if you're, you know, yeah, if you're a crazy. truck driver and you've got one of those fuel apps out there, you can, you know, those fuel apps can save you a lot too, even on the, on the, the premium. I was looking the other day and it was, it was like a 46 cents saving on, on premium by using the, wow. using the app. They've got, uh, but the upside app and mud flap and about yeah. five or six others, it, it can be. Yeah, it can be substantial when when people are using those. So, I just got one of them the other day on my phone because I was like, "I'm going to try it, see if it's a gimmick." And nope, it wasn't. It actually worked. But other thing to think about on that is, you know, we're looking at a car seven no, seven years old, maybe eight, if depending on when the yeah. thing was built. I would I would look and get a good AGM battery for that thing, especially if you're out driving a truck and you don't drive this thing every day. Otherwise, you might find it. Yeah, I drive it every day. Though. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cause it, it's easy. Yeah. For, it, you're at the point where, yeah, it's battery time. If it's got that original key of battery, it's just waiting to fail for you. 
the original Kia yeah, battery. I already had to replace them last year. Oh, yeah. good, 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 good. I got one of them glass pack batteries. Is that what they're called? Yeah, Is yes. Better than lead batteries? Yep, the ones that we recommend here yeah, on the show, though. Yeah, but it was great. Yeah, that they they do run a little more, but you're get it's a premium battery that is is made for yeah. demands that we. Get. I mean, everything's such a high demand vehicle. AGM we talk about. Yeah, and I would say you know anything that's mid two thousands on up, which is pretty much everything nowadays. They're just getting so heavily laden with electronics and computers that you need a battery that's good and stable, and the AGMs work really well for that. So. Yeah, and I always get extra cold cranking up too. I think I forget how many extra cold cranking. Because it's so bitter cold here in Minnesota. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah. Uh, when I first got it, it uh, number four uh, uh, coil failed, and I had to get it towed to the dealership, and then they fixed it, whatever they did. And then about a year later, or less than a year, it failed again, so I got it towed there again. And then they went ahead and tore it down and changed, I think, the valve or something in it, or a new coil or something. But it hasn't failed me since then. Good so, deal. Yeah, so there may have been a, a defect or something in it. I mean, I get they recommend the dealership. I change my oil every five thousand miles, so I get it changed there every five thousand. That sound okay? Uh, I would go less on a Kia. I would go like every three thousand. Yeah, yeah. Because we've in our shop three, three to four thousand. I'd be getting it done. We've put thousands of engines in, okay. literally, in our shop, and we get a pretty good feel for okay. you know who doesn't replace yeah. their engine and how many miles they're changing. They're changing them at 3,000. The okay. people that are four to five, those are when we ask them, hey, uh, what's your oil change? Oh, four, five, six, seven, somewhere in there. And those are the ones we're selling engines to. Yeah. So, yeah, step it up. It's like wow. prevent your heart failure there, your engine. Yeah, I'll do that to 3,000. I'm glad that you mentioned that, though, because, you know, the dealership, they don't really know. You guys work on valve stuff, so I appreciate that. Yep, and they don't have to warranty if it, it a, fails. It's a great car. <laughs> yeah, they are. They're good cars. Exactly. I got an extended warranty on it, so that's really good. It's just a fifty dollars deductible for a hundred thousand miles, so I've, I've only got fifty-four thousand on it. So that's pretty, pretty good. good. Yeah, that's pretty good. Is that a drivetrain warranty? Uh, yes, but they said it's a lot more than that because a while back, uh, my windshield washer container was leaking fluid, and it didn't leak until I washed my windows one time, and then the next morning it'd be empty. So I finally took it in there, and I forget how much it. Yep. Um, it cost me fifty bucks, so that was great. Yeah, that that sounds like an interesting warranty. That might be a good one if it's covering more than just drivetrain and it's got a deductible each time. That's probably yeah. not a bad idea. So we, yeah, we always see different ones and wonder how they work. So, well, hey, thanks for uh, tuning us in as you're traveling across South Dakota, and uh, we uh, wish you the best on your travels. Be safe. Take care. Yeah, thanks, man, for taking my call. God bless. You God too. bless you too. See ya. Bye bye. Oh, cars, cars, cars. So. I've got a question and, and and some statements and all that stuff. So, <laughs> Shannon, all these new trucks we're seeing, I'm looking at a truck. I'm seeing the ads. They're popping up all over. You know, it's like, buy the new 1500. Well, they're popping up because you started looking at trucks. You know, you know they're following. Oh, of course. Yeah, but yeah. Home, out on the road, wherever, you're seeing these ads. Buy a new 1500 Chevy truck, GMC. Buy the new Sierra. Buy the new F-150. Buy the new Ram 1500. Well, as we said, these aren't half tons anymore. 1,500 is not a half. And it drives me nuts when salespeople at dealerships say, oh, yeah, well, the half-ton truck is like, it's not a half-ton truck. Sure it is. It's like, well, why does this half-ton truck, why can you put 4,000 pounds in the bed and why does it pull 13,500 pounds? Well, that's only when it's properly equipped. I said, so it's still a half-ton truck then? It should be like a two-ton truck if you can put 4,000 pounds in it, right? Well, no, that's just stupid. And I'm like, okay, well, the 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 naming go the naming conventions have been around for so long. It's just such a habit for people, and the people they're getting trained by are are the dealer old stuff. Manufacturers aren't calling them that; no? they're calling them 1500, which is good. But here's the point: we have had some customers recently that got trucks and they're pulling heavy loads with them, and they come in and I, you don't want to argue with them, but when they say, yeah, I got this truck and it, you know, it's supposed to pull over 13,000 pounds and I've got a 12,000 pound camper. So it's going to be close. I should be fine. But then we run their vehicle identification number and we see that the truck's rated to pull 8,200 pounds and they've got a 12,000 pound. They're looking at the ad, which the 
first thing they're going to shove down your throat is, oh, look, this truck will pull 13.5, and then it's got a little tiny dot at the end, their asterisk, and in the bottom where you can't even read it, when properly equipped, max toll package, all these things, or, you know, as shown, and maybe not some options not available, you have to find, you absolutely must, if you're buying a used vehicle or a new one, and you plan to tow now or later, you must type that VIN number into a towing website or the manufacturer's website and learn what it's going to be. Yeah, And then when you say, I want the, I really want the white truck, I like the white truck and the options it has, that's the one I really want. Maybe that one doesn't have the towing option that you need, even though it's the one you really want. The tow option between a truck with a Ford, let's say a 24 Ford F-150, when properly equipped with a V6 engine, the hybrid turbo 3.5 V6 engine can pull like 13,500 pounds. That's great. But that same truck without the tow package is like 7,900 or 78 something pounds. That's a huge difference. That's enough to burn your truck up and cause you safety issues, stopping, going, all of it. Uh, You know, they've got different transmissions, different gears, you know, amount of gears and transmissions. Uh, You'll see where one truck might have an eight speed, another one has a 10 or a 12, depending on the type of vehicle you got. There's a lot of changes on these things. So you've really got to know, and you know, we're not trying to shame you and say, well, you're over towing. No, we want to help you not lose money because if you, but let's say you buy a truck that pulls 8,900 pounds and you routinely throughout the summer months, you pull a 10,000 pound camper with it. You're really pushing that thing super hard. What if you have to buy an engine for it in three years when it's out of warranty because it overloaded it and that engine cost you 12 to 15,000 bucks. You're not going to like that. You could have easily have bought the truck that could have towed that in the beginning for that. And, and, and it's a, a better deal. And there's not a lot of difference in the, in the overall gear ratio. Like one had a 323 uh, compared to a 342. So it used to be a big difference and huge mileage. Now the fuel mileage is, is small um, in that. I've got a Yukon with towing package on it. So it's got the, the lower gears in it and it gets like one one and a half miles per gallon less than what's rated for the one with the with the lower gears in it and ten ply tires. So, um, or with the higher gear, you know, the ones that spin. Yeah, it and up. we and we'll see the people that have bought and probably for the ones that scare us the most are when they've bought the truck that has the the turbo engine, like a, mm-hmm. a an EcoBoost or a, or the GM with the four cylinder turbo, or you know the Dodge has got the smaller motor and on some of them, and and then they just they think they've got that heavy towing capacity and though they just they just don't take it it's it, it, they just don't take it you start building up heat and you have problems and that that's where you see the guys with the eco boost that have blown rods right up yep. the side of the block because they build up so much heat and they've got an eight thousand or nine thousand pound tow rating and they think they've got what can pull a mm-hmm. lot more and it's it's problems that we got to just help people be aware of you, you you look at these trucks now and you're seeing these 1500 series trucks which used to be labeled as half tons and you're seeing them with these tow packages priced out at uh, most of them are in the eighties for one that's fully loaded. It's going to be 80 to 85,000 is what we're seeing. Now, if you get a base tow package truck, that has got carpet, but it's like a base model. You can get into one in the, in the high sixties, low, low seventies. It's not going to be near as fancy as the platinum edition Ford or the Denali ultimate edition, you know, or one of these high end like that, but it's going to tow what you need to tow. The other thing you got to think of is I've seen a lot of people lately and they're, they're older people like me, but even older, uh, they've decided, well, I'm going to get into a fifth wheel camper now and I'm going to start towing it. Although my daily driver has been a, a, a Buick park Avenue or a Chevy Traverse for the last 40 years, I've been driving something small and now they're driving a big truck. The new 3,500 trucks and these 45s, which are really common, they look like a regular pickup truck now. You buy one of those trucks, the the new 4,500 Ford is rated over 40,000 pounds. Hmm. And it's like 38,000 for a diesel, you know, like four door Ford one ton type type truck, the 30, you know, the, the 350. So braking is different. Towing is different. When you're hauling a, 
a 32,000 pound 40 foot RV down the road. It's not like driving a car and you don't need a special license in almost every state. So, um, try to get out there and they do have some training classes that I don't know of any right around here, but there have been some I've, I've seen that people have offered for basic training on how to handle emergency situations in big vehicles and how to swerve and not crash and <laughs> those kind of, those kind of things and what to do in emergency stopping uh, conditions and getting out of the way of people. So just some things to think about, you know, is, is, is your new truck, are you over towing it and how do you know? And for us, the easiest way is you, there's so many sites out there that have tow ratings. They're, they're great to go to. And, um, I, I'm, but, but I, 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 yeah, you're right, Shane. I have been looking at a lot of trucks and I'm very surprised when, when I see a truck that used to be a half ton and it says, do you want the fifth wheel or gooseneck ball factory installed in the bed? And you click on it and it says, uh, max tow has all has been automatically added to the package because you put a gooseneck hitch in. Right. Once you wheel. add that, it automatically makes you do yep. those things. And it, it throws it on and. And sometimes it's not that much. I clicked on one the other day and it was a $5,000 add on, but we're already talking at a $70,000 truck. But you know, right now I'm looking, I've every year I've looked to see what they're at. So I know how many years I got to wait to go buy a good used one. (laughs) So now about 23 is when they really stepped up the game and they can cover what I need to pull in a 1500 series truck, but I'm going to wait till they're about four years old before I, uh, I, I pick one up because I uh, buying a new one just seems like an outrageous thing to it's do. It's crazy. But you know what they'll pull. So if you know this is going to be great in a few years for people who want something that can pull good, buy yourself a a 2022 or 3 or 4 model that's 3 or 4 years old and you'll get a quite a savings. Well, like we talked about before, the difference between the probably the 14 and newer of about everything compared to going back to an 08 it's is when it, they upped the gears. Yeah, when they when they went from a four speed auto to a six, there was a big jump. Six to an eight, another big jump. Then eight to ten, it really jumped up because they lowered the gears in the rear end and gave you ten gears. Yep. I mean, even my old truck that that pulls about half of what a new fifteen hundred pulls now uh, with a diesel and dual wheels. If that thing had a ten speed transmission in it, even with that little diesel that's in it. Thing would pull like crazy. Circle back to something you said, Russ, before we wrap this up. And for people that are, that are tuning into this, okay, the aftermarket makes gooseneck hitches. And the, the aftermarket does make aftermarket hitches. And so a lot of folks will look and say, okay, I'm going to buy this truck and then I'll just go buy this aftermarket <laughs> hitch and I'll put it on there. It's almost a shame that the aftermarket makes those now. Because it says it fits. To oh, put it them, fits my 1500. To put it on their truck. It's kind of a shame that it, they say that. Because when you add that option at the factory, it will not let you put that option on unless you add all this other stuff. Yeah. Where you can go to the aftermarket and you can go to the shop and you can put on that hitch. In our part of the world, I know that most of the people at the at the shops are going to say, you know what? You shouldn't be doing this. What are you pulling? They're going to be asking because they don't want to be in the middle I of the problem. Yeah. But it's just kind of embarrassing to me that they even make those things to put on sometimes. Well, they make a fifth wheel hitch for a Ranger. But for old Ranger, and who's might, gonna? Hopefully, it's for pulling a a, a thousand pound fifth they, wheel. They of some do make sort. those like garden trailer yeah. fifth wheels, just so you can do, have a bigger turning range. That, heck, they made a fifth wheel for a VW Beetle. You remember those back in the sixties? <laughs> in the sixties, they made a VW camper to go right on the top center of a VW. You can look them on the internet; they're cool because they they can spin around in a circle and. So yeah, they make them for anything, but look what you're getting. Just because they make it doesn't mean that you should or need to or want to use it for you you want to be safe in the end because you're going to look down on the road down you know 10 years from now you're going to look back and go boy that was a if dave's ramsey would say <laughs> stupid tax you got to pay that now and then so i've paid plenty of mine all right everybody i uh i see chris carter just snuck into the hall and he looks like he's been there for about the last 45 minutes talking to producer doug did he did he roll in or is he, he's on his feet uh they I don't know. He looks like he was dancing out there. And if he's been on his feet for the last 45 minutes, I think it's pretty lame. He didn't show up today. We're shaming Chris. That's all right. (laughs) He'll come in here and help us with that production. We have to do with the multiple ads and all right, everybody take care. We're going to see you next week.